Ned was tired, but strangely elated. There is no pain in talking to someone who is fascinated by every word you say. Once he had made the decision to tell Oliver everything, he had actually enjoyed the experience of examining his memory so minutely. He was rather proud of the accuracy and the detail of his recall. And what a story! He couldn't wait to tell Portia all about it, if he was allowed to. He would tell his father for certain, and Rufus, perhaps, who had been right there that very night. Oliver would probably have to question Rufus anyway, and the whole of the sailing club, too. What a scandal for the school! The cannabis in his pocket, however, that remained a total mystery. Ned wondered if perhaps those Spanish students he had spoken to outside the college had seen the policeman coming up behind him and drop the package into his pocket as a way of saving their own skins. Oliver came back into the room holding a supermarket carrier bag. Details, details, he said. My department, it grieves me to say, is an absolute bugger for details. Here you go. You can put these on in a second. I'm afraid yours got oil all over them in the boot of the car. Ned took the bag and looked inside. He could see a pair of Dunlop tennis shoes, grey trousers, a pullover, and a tweed jacket. Brilliant, he said. Thanks so much. Oliver had set the tape recorder running again. Think nothing of it. Uh, now then, you have a girlfriend, I think you said. Yes, Portia. She doesn't know anything about this. In fact, I've been wanting to ring her. All in good time. Uh, what does her father do, I wonder? Well, he's a history lecturer at the North East London Polytechnic. Oliver could have hugged himself with delight. It was almost too much. A history lecturer. At the NELP, if you please. I see, he said. And uh, just for the record, I wonder if you could give me his full name and address. Um, Peter Fenderman, 14, no, 41, sorry, 41, Plough Lane, Hampstead, London, NW3. But why... Say that again for me, would you? Just the name and address. Peter Fenderman, 41 Plough Lane, Hampstead, London, NW3. Excellent. Jewish, too, by the sound of it. Oh, frabjous day. When things fall into place like this, Oliver told himself, it doesn't do to become arrogant. It is God's work. Ned, you've been fantastic. I can't tell you how sorry I am that we had to hoik you out here and put you through this nonsense. Look, uh, I've got to hair up the motorway in the other direction from you, check out a few things in Scotland, so I'll say goodbye. Mr. Gain can look after you from now on. Ned took the outstretched hand and shook it warmly. Thank you, Mr. Delft. Thank you so much. It's Oliver. And thank you, Ned. It'll make a real difference, you know. You should be very proud of yourself. But what about the drugs? Drugs? What drugs? said Oliver, lifting the spools of tape from the recorder. The whole incident is forgotten, Ned. No, better than forgotten. It never happened. The police never picked you up. In fact, they've never heard of you. They don't know your name. They don't even know what you look like. I promise you this. By tomorrow morning, every record of your arrest will have disappeared forever. And, oh, if only you knew how true that was, Oliver said to himself. How wonderfully, wonderfully true. Phew! Ned smiled as relief flooded through him. If the press had heard about it, my father would have been, well, devastated. Oliver checked his watch. I'm afraid it may be a little while before you can leave. I'm taking the only car. We've sent for another, though, and it shouldn't be too long before it gets here. I'd get into those clothes now, if I were you. Have a safe journey home, and if you need anything, just ask Mr. Gain. The pullover fitted. There was that to be said. It smelled of rotten onions, but at least it fitted him perfectly. The jacket and tennis shoes were too tight by miles, and the trousers seemed to have been made for a five-foot man with a forty-eight-inch waist. Oliver hadn't thought to include a belt, so Ned hunted around the kitchen looking for string. He found some in a drawer and drew it five times around his middle. He was picking up a knife to cut the string when he heard the door open. "'Oh, hello, Mr. Gain,' he said, turning with relief. "'I was hoping you might—' Gain stepped forward. Before Ned knew what was happening, his right arm had been twisted behind his back so high that the bone was wrenched from its socket. Ned screamed as much from the sound of the crack and pop as from the pain. He screamed again when Gain's enormous fist slammed into the side of his head, dropping him to his knees. But when Gain followed up with a blow of incredible force to the back of his neck, 
Ned was already incapable of screaming any more. Mr. Delft had been right as usual, thought Gain, returning the knife to the drawer. Nasty piece of work. Weak, though, he said to himself, looking down at Ned's unconscious body. Very weak. Like wrenching a wing from a chicken. Where's the challenge in that? He heard the sound of a van in the driveway, and pausing only to deliver a heavy and pleasingly crunchy kick to Ned's ribs, Mr. Gain made his way out into the hallway.